edition of the final whistle on learmedia.tv and um, our usual email is info at learmedia.tv press the red button on the bottom right hand side to subscribe to our channel and thank you for all the people who've done so already it's very much appreciated and uh, we were in talks uh, well we were, we were in talks with people there might be some development for this program in a few weeks time we let you know anyway it's all down to the contributors on the program you know so we'll be speaking to them, to, to them again at the end of the week. Anyway, welcome, Anna Moore. Hi, Pat. Welcome, Martin Waters. Hi, Pat. Welcome, uh, Chris Price. Good evening, all. Welcome, Joe Waters. Evening, all. And welcome, Derwin Honan. Nice to have you all on board again, lads. Now, we're going to start off with soccer. Obviously, the premiership that we normally cover is... To all full up with international soccer matches over the weekend. And from our own perspective here, the Republic of Ireland got four points out of six, uh, which, well, they played uh, Portugal and Luxembourg, respectively. So nil nil and three, three nil, uh, I think was a good return with limited resources. What they're trying to do is rebuild with youth. You have to do that. I'm talking about Ireland. Now, obviously, Luxembourg is only a population of 600,000 anyway, but they had their most successful year as well in the European Championship. We got nine points in their group, which was the highest number of points they got, I think, in their history. Correct me if I'm wrong. England are playing San Marino tonight. We'll assume, we'll assume they'll get all three points. Although, you know, do you remember when they played San Marino back in one of the competitions and San Marino scored after one minute? Do you remember that? Yeah, I Stuart back pass. Yeah, it did. Jesus. They're 2-0 up already against San Marino. Mm -hmm. so, so, Martin, did you see the match, the, the, the matches with the Republic in the soccer? Yeah, I, I was very impressed by their performances in both games. Um, I think in the Portugal game, <clears throat> it was great to see an Irish team to take the game to Portugal rather than, I suppose, sitting back, absorbing, um, you know, I suppose... 60-70% Portuguese possession and hoping to get something on the counter-attack. Um, I think the approach taken by Ireland now under Kenny is a very much a, it's more of a proactive uh, approach and it's more of a possession game. Um, now sometimes it can look a bit over and back, over and back and maybe lacks penetration but I think as time has progressed there seems to be I suppose a greater emphasis on playing the ball through the lines and you know, switching the play to, I suppose, keep turning the defence and keep moving the, the opposition's defence. And, you know, it resulted in some success last night with the 3-0 victory. Um, but against Portugal in particular, I felt, you know, we were probably just one or two players short of beating Portugal. You know, if we had yeah. a striker, if we'd somebody, you know, like players of the past that we had, somebody that could finish um, and a presence in, in, in the box, I, I think... The way we played, we probably, even though we got a draw from the game, uh, we, we actually could have got more. Um, but look, four points from from six in our last two games, it's been a good ending to the, the campaign after a, a very, very shaky start. And Anna, did you see any of the soccer yourself? No, no, I saw Portugal all right, Joel, some of it. Um, we had our Monster Boxing ch Championship Saturday and Sunday, so all I saw was an arena. <laughs> All you were watching was right crosses, left crosses, and That's it straight, now. Straight, straight hooks. We'll get back to that later on. You can tell us all about it later on. Joe, did you get to see the soccer? No, I didn't see any of it. Uh, I just read it. I, yeah. I actually fo followed the game on the uh, on the Irish Independent um, blog kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, the Portugal game. Uh, I didn't realise that the uh, Luxembourg game was yesterday. Uh, I actually went to see uh, the local women's soccer team play in the semi-final of the uh, the women's national championship here, uh, and I watched the uh, did they win uh, Man City Chelsea women's game in the morning. Oh, uh, excellent! Here, so that was my soccer for the for the weekend. And Derwin, you tell us about your international travels later on, but did you get to see any soccer? She only came in back yesterday, was it? Yeah, and he got back yesterday, so I've still I've not seen any football at all. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you won't see any either tonight if you're watching between England and San Marino. No, they're winning 2-0, it's comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and Chris, did you see any of the, the Ireland soccer match? I matches? saw the match against uh, Portugal. Didn't watch it last night. Um, I saw Wales play the other day. Um, I thought they were impressive enough. Um, played decent football. Um, yeah, look, Ireland. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound like I'm bleating on. I mean, look, they did the best, but you have to remember Portugal did not have their full strength team because they, they, they were they were looking towards last night's match against Serbia, and they basically undone themselves by losing at home to Serbia, which which has massive ramifications ramifications of Portugal because Serbia qualify outright, and now Portugal go into the playoffs, oh. and and there's going to be some cracking teams in those playoffs. And nothing is going to be taken for granted out of those. It will be a two-legged affair. And, you know, it all depends on... It depends. I'm not sure when those matches are going to be played. I think they're going to be played in maybe March or April or something like that. And I get the feeling coming towards the end of a long season after another long season previously, injuries will tell its toll. And that and whoever will be available, you know, you could see, you know, certain players not be able to make those playoffs and it'd be absolute bloodbath and you could see some big names not getting there. Yeah, and that man Mitrovic, of course, said it again for Serbia. There's one team who are the most impressive in the European section in my book and that's Denmark. Nine games played, nine games won, no goals conceded. They're absolutely flying. They actually because- conceded one. They actually conceded one. They nearly caused it. There was a one record that I was reading this year day on one of the European websites. They actually believe it or not, they beat the Pharaohs three <laughs> one. Oh, yeah. Believe it. The only the only team that scored against them was the Pharaohs. Would you credit it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and and if they had a, I think they play Scotland tonight. I think they do. I'm not sure. I'll yeah. check. But if at the moment if they were going to go where not only were they going to be unbeaten, but they hadn't conceded a goal, but the Pharaohs got one in. But they are the most impressive in Europe, of course. Usual suspects, uh, well, obviously Germany, France, and uh, Denmark, Croatia, they have all qualified. All the usual ones seem to be coming through. South America, the South American, I know I've been following that, but um, in poor position in South America is Ecuador, Chile, Brazil, Peru, Argentina. They all they all won, of course. Now, Chile are top of the pile there, or Brazil, Arabic, Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, they're all in 16 points, so it's the top six there, as we know, the top five or six, and then there's playoffs with other people, with Oceania, but the top six go through. So it looks like Brazil, Argentina, Ecuador, Chile, Colombia, either Uruguay or Colombia for the last spot, but the usual suspects come through, you know, which is, I suppose, and we know there's been controversy in Iran, Jordan v. Iran and ladies um, after a shootout, and uh, Jordan have objected it's the first time ever that the Iran women have gone through to the tournament, the finals of the tournament, the women's tournament, that is. So they're objecting to the goalkeeper for Iran, who they said was a man, not a woman. <laughs> so um, <they're, laughs> it sounds funny, but I mean, I, I, I had to look online. No, obviously are they going to send crocodile? Are they going to send crocodiles on D to check? <laughs> you know, uh, it's those burkers, isn't it? You're what burkers at the end of the game? <laughs> they said that the goalkeeper is a man, and I looked at the. Now, obviously, I didn't look. What did you look at, Pat? I looked at the picture. <laughs> Let me get it out. I looked at the photograph, the team photograph, and uh, well, I mean, obviously, you can't tell. You just can't tell on the team photograph, you know. So look. Uh, that that will that will unfold as we you speak. See, as, that will be ah. very very careful because there's a couple of things that you could say about that. I mean, if you take Castor Samania, the South African runner, who's um, they, they reckon there's an issue with the chromosomes and 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 the testosterone level, and then you've got what happened in East Germany in the 70s and 80s, where basically at least three of that I heard of, based you know they actually had the um, the full kind of um, they went from the full transition from female to male because, you know, they had developed everything, you know, because everything, because of the testosterone and the drugs that they had, that mm-hmm. they just basically were men, you know, without the essentials. But they had, to, they, they did what they, they did what they did. They did what they had to do because they were living like men because they, you know, their voices were there, you know, everything. Yeah. And we, it was, it's, I mean, we're laughing. 
But it's 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 actually horrific what they went through at such an early age. It was, I mean, if you if you do a bit of research on what happened in the seventies and eighties, they they were kids that were taken from their families' homes, you I know, know, and put into like a something like a prison and given and were forced. It was it was they were forced on a cocktail of drugs. It was and horrendous stuff, horrendous stuff. And while we're on soccer, Martin, uh, yes. Steve. He has been appointed Aston Villa manager. I suppose, would, would that be probably one of the best he could do coming from Scotland? Not saying anything against Scottish soccer, but Stephen Gerrard. Would it be a middle of the, ta- middle of the table team? Well, he has a job there. Yeah, well, I think Villa have higher ambitions than middle of the table. Um, I think they'd be looking, uh, their ambitions are for like top six uh, going down the road. Um, the investment in the club would indicate the same. So yeah. I, I would suggest it's actually a big job for him you know he's coming from Rangers <clears throat> where in three seasons they've won the league um, and, and that has been it you know like I think it was St. Johnston won cup double last year um, so like he's won the league with Rangers which is you know which was a good achievement but um, he has a lot to prove still um, so the Villa job is a big job to take <clears throat> and you know the, the Villa manager who, who was sacked Dean Smith has now taken the Norwich job yeah. So there's a, bit, there's a bit of managerial um, merry-go-round uh, going on in the Premiership currently and, and with Newcastle as well, and you've Eddie Howe going in there. Um, so like it's a case of watch this space. These next few games leading into Christmas will be critical. Um, Newcastle are playing um, Norwich, I think, on the, I think it's the 30th or the 1st of December. Uh, so, they're, you know, these games are really big. And, and for these managers, they really need to hit the ground running because those teams are very close to the bottom. If Norwich and Newcastle are at the bottom, so yeah. people aren't far off. So it's a big job for Stephen Gerrard. And Joe, you said Joe also, Brendan Rodgers is tipped to go to Man United. I know the whole world is tipped to go to Man United, but do you think Brendan Rodgers would be a big, a good fit for Man United, do you think? You know what? I do. Um, you know, to be honest, I thought Brendan Rodgers did a great job at, uh, at Liverpool. Uh, yeah. You know, if Stevie Gerrard doesn't slip, Liverpool maybe win the title <laughs> that year and Rodgers becomes a legend all of a sudden. He's, the, he's the, the equivalent of what Klopp is doing now if he had won it back then. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's a real tough one. I mean, because it, it's a huge step for anybody. The, the same way that uh, Stephen Gerrard going to from Rangers to uh, Villa. Aston, you yeah. might look at Rangers and you might look at Rangers being a, a big club. Aston Villa has the potential to be a huge club. And you only have to remember they won the, the league championship and the European Cup in the last 30 odd years. So they finished just outside the top uh, four with uh, Martin O'Neill a couple of times when they spent when they were prepared to spend money. Yeah. Um, so the potential, the size of their ground, the size of their fan base, the potential for Aston Villa is huge. And, uh, you know, that is a great stepping stone for Stephen Gerrard if he can get the, the job done right. Uh, I think Brendan and- Rodgers did the, the right thing when he went to Celtic and then came back to Leicester and um, I started at Leicester. Um, but, you know, taking the United job is is a whole different animal. It brings a whole different set of uh, challenges. Would would he fit there with the players they have? Yeah, I think so. And I, I think that he could get them, you know, the way he likes to play. He likes to be more aggressive. Um, he likes players playing on the front foot. Uh, and doesn't, to be honest, he doesn't take a lot of nonsense from people. No. You know, it's his way or if, if you don't want it to be his way, you're gone. And that's it. Um, but uh, I, I would I would think he would do a good job there. I think he'd do a real good job there. Um, but will they give him the job is the question, you know? That's, what do you think? Uh, do you think they'll go for Brendan Rodgers? Do you think uh, United should go for him? I think, I think he, he could be a good fit there. But as, as Joe said, um, I would hope the way they've been playing at the moment, uh, it seems to be that um, if they don't want to play for their manager, they won't play. I mean, as I said before, Joe, they're getting a big, big wages and it doesn't matter who's in charge. them. They should be doing their best every week. 
for the job that they're inclined to do. Yeah. You know, uh, with 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 Stephen Gerrard, I mean, I'm a bit fearful. I'm a bit fearful because Rangers, and we all know the Scottish League isn't brilliant, but he done a great job with Rangers. But the thing about it is, he's coming to Villa and. I'm thrilled, and I know when he when he goes to Liverpool, or that he will get a standing ovation. But it, if he doesn't do what they want, and I don't mean not do a good job, because I think he will. But if they, he doesn't get him into the position they want to be in, will he be sacked? And then what happens? And you know, yeah. these are there's roundabouts in it that I worry for him about. You know. Yeah, and Derwin, would you be happy as a man you supported to see Brendan Rodgers at the helm? I'd just be happy to see United getting back to where they should be. Yeah, yeah. And that, that would be in the top four at least, would it? Top two, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. top one, really. Top, top one, to <laughs> be honest. That's, uh, so. that's yeah, why, you, you know, just an Atlanta. interesting thing on Steven Gerrard. You know, they, make, they have the big hype about him, how well he did in Scotland and what have you. I mean, he did well. He won one league championship up there, right? There was an article in the paper that, and I'm not sure which club it was, but it was either St. Johnston or somebody else, uh, or Kilmarnock, that the manager who'd been at Kilmarnock or whatever club it was for the same length of time had won more silverware than Stephen Gerrard had while he was Johnson. in Scotland. Johnson, you know, yeah. so they, they make a big hype about it because of uh, the person's name and what have you. Um, but they... You know, they haven't really done anything. The thing that, the real thing they did was stop Celtic winning 10 in a row. Yeah. 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 And of course, you get the pat in the back for that one, especially if you're a Rangers manager. It, it, uh, you can do no wrong now. Yeah. But apparently, he can do some wrong after cons- he left. Yeah, he's consolidated the club, Rangers. I think. They did well in Europe. They got into the group stage. They did well in Europe. He's consolidated the, the club. When you look where they were a couple of years back, Rangers, I mean, I mean, it took them a good bit to get back. You know, they haven't spent a whole lot of money. Van Bronckhorst, the the Dutch player, former player, is in line to take the Rangers' job. That's the speculation. I, mean, I don't know that, but a speculation on the on the Twitter feed. I have to keep up to Twitter. My colleague was telling me mm-hmm. here. Twitter. But anyway, that's them. And before we leave, but um, Donny Van Der Beek, um, Derwin, he's he wants to leave. Thirty-four million, three and a half games. It's a very expensive transfer, isn't it? What's wrong? Why is he getting his game? Is it the manager says, I don't fancy this chap? I I, 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 I have no idea. What I don't understand is how he doesn't get a game because yeah. Fred has been so inconsistent. Oh. Fred, Fred's passing is shocking, isn't it? Yeah, Fred Flintstone, they call him. Is it Fred Flintstone? Well, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, but was- it's, it's a sad indictment of United when you have uh, Donny van der Beek and Sancho. Yeah. Two players that played, what, something like 120, 130 million for it, and they can't get in the team. Yeah. I mean, what, what is, why, why are you buying these young players if you're not going to play them? It's a little you know? bit, They're not getting any better sitting in the stand. It's a no. little bit like what AC Milan did in the, in the late 90s. Late- 80s, early 90s, they bought fellas so that no one else could get them and have them. Um, I mean, do you remember AC Milan when Rod Holland was there, uh, Marco van Basten? They bought fellas for like 15, 20 million in Italy. And that's probably what, symptomatic to the problems that there are in Italy at the moment, is that they bought these fellas so no other club could get them and they didn't play them. I remember, remember Lentini, who was a good player. I think he died in a car crash subsequently a few years later. Um, he was a great player, but he only played a few play- games to AC Milan because he was too good for AC Milan not to have, but not good enough for the team. If you know what I mean, he did. They didn't yeah. want a. They didn't want um, Napoli. They didn't want Juventus. They didn't want Inter getting him. So they says, "Right, we'll have a new, and we'll play you when we want you." But if you're yeah. not playing, well, you'll sit there. And there's a little bit of that with Donny van der Beek. And I mean, I've seen Sancho play. I follow the German football a lot, and I've seen Sancho play for for Dortmund many times and he's absolutely electric brilliant player and he probably now regrets going because he's probably thinking Jesus I mean I, I'm playing at a better st-. he's probably thinking at this stage now 
that the standard in Dortmund is better than what he's playing at United? Yeah, I mean, obviously McTominay is another one and Fred to get into the team. And anyway, we can speculate on like about one team. But before we leave soccer, lads, what about Ronaldo's jersey and the removal of it? Wasn't that... for all? I'd be sexist about it. For all the ladies, that's freeze-framed when he took off his jersey. I think that that was uh, freeze-framed. I know some of the lads here in the station... Uh, it nice. sounds like you got more pleasure out of that than a lot of others, I tell you. <laughs> His abs, his abs are the things I were looking at. Did but, you count them? <laughs> but Matt, what do you think of the idea? I mean, I, th- I thought it was fantastic, you know. I know, yeah. okay, you know, not like the old days when we could all run onto the pitch and get the autographs of the players, you know. They're like pieces of gold now. Matt, what do you think of that? Crack? I thought it was a fantastic gesture by him to to hand over his shirt to the, the young girl that came onto the field. Yeah. Um, it's a memory for, for life. Yeah. For, for that young person and, and for I suppose you know it, you see a lot of things happening in, in football where there seems to be a disconnect between the players and the supporters it's almost like the players are untouchable yeah. <clears throat> sometimes it's nice to see that there's there's a human element to these guys that we, we're, we're kind of like it's, it's like as if it's, it's forbidden you know they can't have a connection with the fans um, and that was that was like a lovely uh, moment, and it was good to see it because <clears throat> it's uh, it's something that she will, you know, she probably frame that jersey and have it for the rest of her days. Um, and what, what a fantastic memory! I think it's great, Joe. You were in that show the weekend. Are they, is it the same rules over in the United States where people uh, you're not allowed on the pitch after soccer matches to to say hello to your heroes? Right. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. 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 And. Yeah. So you were never harmed in all your years playing uh, professional soccer in England when you used to be mobbed going off the field, you know? There was never any... No, <laughs> no I mean, there was, there was never anything... Like, I mean, players were always... Um, players were always, like, you don't touch them no matter what happens. Uh, yeah. It, uh, I remember one time we, were, we, played, uh, we played somewhere, I think it was at Hull, and we got a draw late on, and uh, all of a sudden, there's a after the game, we're going back to the coach, and we see the uh, the Hull fans coming towards us, and we went, "Oh God," uh, because it was a big rivalry, and mm-hmm. they, they, there had been some trouble. And I thought, "Oh, jeez, we're in trouble here." And uh, the fella, we said, "Hey, lads, no, we're just heading back to the bus." Oh no, you're all right. It's our own fellas we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just things like that that happen, you know. That um, uh, you know, even even at Millwall, you know, I remember playing the cup match there, and we're beating them. Uh, we went the goal down. We we're goal down at halftime and scored six goals in the second half. And uh, I'm coming off, and Millwall fans were notorious for uh, for being um, nasty and what have you. And I'm walking along the touchline and I'm thinking I'm going to get pelted here. And and uh, one of the wags from the crowd sh- uh, shouts out, hey, why don't you leave your sub on the bench and give us a chance? You know? <laughs> so <laughs> players, you know, players are never touched. They get a little bit of fun out of it and what have you. Oh, but, yeah. um, you know, it, uh, you know, you'd sign autographs for as long as anybody wanted them. You know, mm-hmm. now it's unheard of. For players to do that, it is uh, anyway. Ronaldo was a class act. Anyway, you know, he, he, if any player was going to do it, he would be the chap that would be have that awareness. Not saying that no one else has it, but anyway, we wish that lady, that little girl, well with her jersey. I, I, I hope she manages to hold on to it. The final whistle is the program on LearnMedia.tv. Info at LearnMedia is our email. Now, rugby union, obviously, Wales beat Fiji over the weekend. We'll get the, the important games out of the way first, and uh, England. Got one over in Australia again, 32-15. And um, let me see now. Uh, South Africa did the number on Scotland, 30-15. <laughs> and we had a match then in Nantes. Oh, on. dear God, get on with it, for Christ's sake. I, 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 failed, <laughs> I failed to mention the Aviva. It's Lansdowne Road to me, uh, Ireland, 29, All Blacks, 20. To me, the most surprising aspect of it, Chris, we've got Chris first on this, is that Ireland were down at half time after having 76% possession? I thought, oh no, we're going to have another one of these at half time. You know what, Pat? You'd be great fun at nights out. 
I really do. You definitely are a glass half empty kind of guy, right? <laughs> and you, I, I've been waiting all weekend for this. <laughs> I, I have been waiting all weekend for this. So yeah, much so-, so that I sent Pat Barry a little gift of humble pie direct, yeah. delivered by Andy Farrell directly to Pat. <laughs> That's and right. he says, and he says, oh yeah, I says, oh, I, I, I look at that and I says, yeah, Pat, you're missing a fork there for that. You know, that's, you know, and look, and fair enough, Pat made his comment and, you know, he's, he obviously regrets saying it now, but the point of the matter is this, is that we're not going to hang Pat for what he said, because basically it is symptomatic of the fickle nature of sport these days, especially in this country, yeah. where we look to, if we lose a match or didn't play well, sack the manager, get the new guy in. And we're not giving guys time enough. And it was proved categorically this weekend that it does take time for a new coach to come in, to develop a style, bring his own guys in, to have the mantra and to basically get on with it. And, you know, you have to remember that it has been very disruptive for the last 18 months. They didn't really have a summer campaign. They went straight into, you know, there's been the the, 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 the domestic league competition nearly lasted up into July. So it was all over the place. And I think once he got a chance in November to get a couple of weeks behind him, then it just showed that there seems to be a game plan. Now, the only one thing I will say about is this. They're going to have to make a decision about number 10 because, again, and I don't want to be saying it and repeat myself ad nauseum, but Johnny Sexton got another concussion on the weekend. He's now missing for six weeks. And, you know, you know, if the guy wants to recognize his children at the age of 50, then somebody may have to make a decision instead of him declaring himself fit like he did the last yeah. two weeks. And I yeah. think someone has now got to bite the bullet with Johnny Sexton and says, look, there's enough stuff going on about what happened with the England World Cup team in 66. There's enough stuff going on about the NFL. There's enough stuff going on about what's happened in Aussie rules and stuff like that, that somebody has to have that difficult conversation and say to him, look, Johnny, What's going on here, son? And that's something that they're going to have to look at. And Martin, did you get to see the match? I did. I watched all of it. Um, yeah. It was just like, oh, it was. I couldn't believe uh, my eyes, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> the kind of the, the the volume of possession that Ireland had. Um, you know, I think you said was it over seventy percent in the first half. Mm-hmm. It, like it was, it was, it was sixty percent and sixty percent territory overall in the game. Ireland had like. We were in there 22, something like 16 times, and we scored. We came away with four scores. So it was 12 times we came away with zero. Now, that will show you how good the defense of New Zealand was. And yeah. like their defense was just absolutely phenomenal. Like I couldn't, uh, and they lived on scraps. They lived on kind of moments of brilliance, and they still almost beat us. You know, like the, you could say we had a kind of harsh enough decision going against us with the trying the first half from Kelleher that was this, but it wasn't from Kelleher, it was from uh, the, the prop there um, that, that scored, but Kelleher was penalised for a, a kind of a double movement, yeah, which, is rarely pe- yeah. which is rarely which is rarely penalised these days, but it happens to get penalised when you play New Zealand. Yeah, I uh, thought not, not quite a caution. I thought the referee was such a, a clown Thought he kind of did his best to ruin the game. To be honest, he yeah, loved yeah. listening to himself, didn't he? Yeah. Well, he he wanted to be, the, I suppose, the centre of attention. Yeah. Uh, rather than letting the players in the match be the centre of attention, I sometimes think we shouldn't actually even hear the referee. He should be, no. you know, it should be someone in the background that's you know. Well, thank kind of God that other, thank God that other referee from Wales. What's his name? That fellow. Nigel. Nigel. Yeah, Nigel Owen. Gone. Thanks God he's gone. My Why? God. Why? He was terrible. He never stopped talking, and most it was to himself. George, no, 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 don't agree no. there. No. Don't agree. No, 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 no. You're talking wrong there. No, you see, you talking wrong there. Match. I just want to say something, boys. Yeah. Six nil now. Hat trick oh. for Kane. Another hat trick for Harry Kane against. Um, what has that got to do with rugby? I have no <laughs> idea. You <laughs> said <laughs> and Darwin. Do we really care here in Ireland about England? They're yeah, ranked 200 I mean, in the world. You know what? Oh, come on, lads. They're going to win the World Cup then. now. You know, Derwin, Derwin, you, you do not, you do realise that San Marino are lucky to get nil here. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I know you'd appreciate it. It's a sports program. Do you see any drug, Brianna? No, but I, I was reading about it. Um, as I said, I was locked in for two days, but um, I was reading and, and the, New, the New Zealand, we say, manager, coach, he was saying that, um, that you know, they deserve, Ireland deserved to win it, but that in the second that they were disallowed, were they a try? And he thought it was a try. And he felt that in the second half, he did think that Ireland should have had, he couldn't believe that Ireland hadn't, could be down five ten at half time, yeah. and he he felt that um they slowed completely the game down in the second half with cramps and that it broke up the fast running of the New Zealand players. And he said if that was their game plan, then they'd done it well, and you couldn't fall from for it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I make this before you go on, Pat. I think the point about the referee, which is which is is, is very important here, that he took so much time over some of the. TMO decisions. Yeah. Yet on the 78 minute one, and one of the Irish guys was injured. Yeah. He says, "Is that a HIA or is that an injury?" He says, "If it's an injury, we need to play on because we're losing too much time." The only person who was losing time was the referee and making inordinate time decisions on the team. On and this, and they're going to have to cut this short because yeah. matches are now going to nearly two hours. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. people will lose interest in that. They will. They will actually. I don't know. As to me, I saw the whole match for my sins, believe it or not. I happened to be at the right place at the right time. I thought I'd be doing something else, but I was able to watch the whole match and I thought it was just so fantastic to see an Irish team in the faces of another team for the whole match, not for 10 minutes, for the whole game from start to finish. They were right on top. They played on the line, I think. Is that what you say? I'm not a rugby expert. They played on the line all the time, which was a fantastic achievement. And I don't want to be some condescending. And fair play to the Irish team. What we want now, Andy Farrell, is to at least get into the semi final of the World Cup. That's what we want now. We don't want to be going out again with another hard look story. We want more and more of it. Is that right? Matt, what do you think? I think there's like obviously the, the big one is the out half position and making yeah. sure that there's like Johnny Sexton would be, is it 38 in two years' time? Mama Short's 38. Um, like, Jesus, like that's the oldest South half in rugby. Um, so <clears throat> we need to have a backup plan and we need to start now. He's out for the next six weeks, so you can be guaranteed Carberry will be starting against Argentina. And really? you'll, have, you'll have McCarthy coming in uh, as maybe the third choice. Um, so, but we need to probably continue that through the Six Nations. I don't think there's any value in playing um, Sexton in the Six Nations because I don't think what's that going to serve we know what he's going to do we know what he can do but the other guys need games and it's fine playing for your province playing for Munster and playing in these league matches and stuff like that and playing the odd Heineken Cup match but you cannot beat a competitive test match where right. you know there's something really at that. stake Is it all over for Murray except the shake hands? I don't think, I think so. it is I think it is I think there's still another guy with injury problems yeah, yeah, injury problems. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, well, it'd be sad with him because he's been a fantastic player, you know. But I mean, no... he's been, he's got no game time really. I mean, maybe a ten or fifteen minutes from once than one of the matches I was at since the Lions, and he did what he didn't play all the Lions matches, even though he was like the the replacement captain. And um, so I think there's, I mean, I don't think he's ever fully recovered from that neck injury. That he had doesn't seem to be. I mean, yeah. for a guy at that class, he went on yeah. 10 minutes, yeah. you know. Well, that was our rugby union on the final whistle, lads, and the uh, fair play. And I said, Wales, I said, but Scotland, I know Scotland lost 30 15. I saw the highlights, and they were very unlucky, actually. I know the score doesn't reflect that. I know it's a stupid thing to say, but I thought Scotland are playing very well. They're playing good rugby, you know. England, of course, are England. They beat Australia again. England will always be tough, I think. You know, I think they'd be one. Of, they're in the running to win the World Cup in my book. That English team, you know, the way they're developing. That's only my opinion. What do I know about rugby? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, we found out that over the last yeah. couple of weeks. <laughs> 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 now, before we go on to something else, Formula One. Look, there's not many fans of Formula One, but for a man to come from tenth in the grid, we get two penalties. That's Lewis Hamilton, and to win. The Brazilian Grand Prix, I thought, I watched it. I watched the uh, highlights of it, rather. I thought it was just terrific. I know anybody I hear on the panel see it at all. 
the, yeah, I um, watched. I was forced into it again. My young lad forced me into uh, it. There you go. But did you enjoy? <laughs> I think actually it was a good. It was good, but I. The problem is, is that the car that Hamilton was all weekend was the fastest car by a country mile, and you could actually see him doing what he did, um, and. Once he went past Verstappen, game was game over. Like I mean, they, I find it that they said it was a thrilling race. Ugh, it wasn't really. Once he once he had overtaken him, he was gone, and that was it. Game over, ball burst. But um, I, I, you know what? Is there fourteen points between him? I I think it's going to come to the fact that I, I I think someone is going to have a bit of a calamity in the last three races. I think either Hamilton or Verstappen would be will not finish a race. I just get that feeling the pressure will tell someone's going to make a mistake and either or will not finish a race, allowing someone to either win it by a, a street and extend their advantage or overtake. I don't know. I just I just got this gut feeling. Some The way it's coming down, something big is going to happen over the next few races. You didn't see any of that, Joe. Did you any of the, the racing? I did. I did watch a bit of it. I watched the highlights like you. Um, I watched the... Um, the situation where uh, Verstappen forced Hamilton off the off the track, uh, and you know he was fortunate enough and uh, got beyond that and uh, came out and won it. Um, just the way he's been going and what he's been getting away with, uh, because earlier on the season, if I'm not uh, making a mistake, Hamilton got fined. He got penalised. Uh, in one of the early races for something similar. Yeah. And Verstappen seems to be able to um, uh, get away with these things. And I just wonder from the, you know, from looking at it and where it's going and the, the level of um, intensity between the two camps. Uh, like Chris says, somebody is maybe going to do something bad on the track that is going to force one of them out of it. Yeah, and which before, would be a terrible yeah. shame if that was to happen. And uh, um, Anna, yeah. um, we leave Formula One there. We'll get back to soccer and we still have a bit of golf to cover before we wrap up. But Anna, do you remember Bernard Dunn's fight with the wonderful Kiki Martinez? Do you remember that it, fight? I do. Within, what was it? Within less than a minute and a half, Martinez right. knocked Bernard Dunn out. Were you above it? 2007. I just settled into my seat when he was knocked out. But uh, 2007. He, he did it again over the weekend. Kiki I mean, if Martin. you think of it, Martinez was only 21 then. He was 20. And Saturday night, he caused a major upset. Oh, you couldn't you know, because Because Kil Gall Galahad was, was favourite. Like, I mean, they, they weren't even thinking of Martinez winning it. And I mean, no. 17 years after... He beaten Bernard Dunn to come back and win a world title again. I mean, that's phenomenal. You know, I mean, he must be super fit to do that. You know, he was super fit. Yeah, I, I didn't see it live, but I looked back to that afterwards. So he beat a kid Galahad. He's twenty five, almost thirty six. Right, he was twenty one when he, he was twenty one. Twenty one when he beat Bernard Dunn. Yeah, he got Dunn cold that night. All right. Yeah. You know? I think I he caught Gallagher's very cold as well. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of a guy that has this punch that at the weight he's at, if he hits you, you're in trouble. Um, so, like, I, I, actually a good story, the time of the Dunn fight, um, <clears throat> it was the day after a wedding where I, I was in a bar with numerous other people and every, it was all about Bernard Dunn. It was, it was, he was going to win that fight and that was the end of it. And yeah. So there, there was a draw and everyone put in a tenner into the hat and it They'd say, oh, done, done in round one, done in round two, done in round three. One guy said Martinez in round one, and he took the pot about 500 quid or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, so he knew but something that none of us I knew. Don't, I don't think that uh, Kid Gal Galahad's uh, corner should have left him back for the sixth round because he was gone at the end of the fifth round and the bell saved him. You the know, and fight. that, that yeah. the referee should have went over and looked in his eyes and he had to see because the minute he came back out, he was gone. I, you know, I, so he wasn't fit to come out for that sixth round, you know. I'm I'm looking for, I, I don't know where I wrote down, there was a British girl boxing over the weekend. It was the first time I saw someone knocked out while they're standing up. 
and you want to see it. No, it is, it's not a joke. The American I guy, you, you see if I, I forget the names, I had written down another piece of paper in my bag. She hit her with her uh, right hand flush in around there, and the referee went immediately over to her before she fell, you know, because she was about to fall and counted out the fight. You know, it's a, it's a stunning punch for a lady, you know, for a woman. But anyway. Joe Ward won. Joe Ward is another professional. Joe won over the weekend as well. And, and uh, what's happening in the IAB again about this? these Leinsters in Arclor, these Leinsters in death. I know. Well, you what see... What's going on with it, In Central Council, which I'm a member of, uh, well, up to two... For another two weeks, anyway, until the election. Uh, Are you going to vote in or out? I don't know. But the thing about it is, what happened there was um, Leinster, Connacht and Dublin. Now, Dublin we treat like a province because they have as many clubs. Yeah. They they uh, came out and took their support away from Central Council. Central Council had nothing to do with what they pulled away from. There was two neutral um, directors supposed to come in. Four names went in, two were to be picked. And the new way it is because they're giving it back to the clubs, that then four names will go out to the clubs in Ireland and they vote for who they wanted to come in. Now, one of them was Darren O'Neill, one of them was Fiona Hennigan, who is now um, president of Connor Council, and Olive Kyo, who was very involved. Her daughter is an accountant, but and somebody from the north. But they said, whoever the three people were they, on the board, they said that they didn't meet the criteria. Now, well, in another part of our rule book, that criteria can be put aside. But therefore, Central Council runs boxing. It had nothing to do with picking directors. But instead of just putting the vote of no confidence in the directors, which Central Council would have backed them and went with them, they pulled it from Central Council. So Central Council then had a meeting and put a vote for no confidence in the officer board of the three units. So as such, they weren't affiliated Leinster to run a championship. They didn't want the kids to lose out. So Central Council decided, well, Leinster came out last week saying they weren't running it. So Central Council said they'd run it the way the kids wouldn't lose out. Then two days before this, um, Leinster decided that they'd run one, but under the auspice of 11 county championships. Yeah. So it will be very interesting to see if at the moment with the elections, uh, the three units that broke away as such have put people in against all the officer board. I think when all is said and done, because I couldn't make head and tail of this between the Linz of the Central That's Council. what happened. That's uh, yeah, i glad you explained that to me because I, I read the two articles and I tried to get to the nub of the thing. I'm used to reading stuff, but I think after all this time and after all that went on at the Olympics, you would think and after all the success for the boxers, our own boxers winning gold and medals are all this, that the administrators of the sport would really, really knuckle down and just cop themselves on, and I think, you know? Well, you, you see, I mean, a lot has been blamed on Central Council. Central Council did not break the rules. The three units broke the rules. Yeah. And so as should, such, Central Council put a vote of no confidence in them, right? The vote was taken... But that still has to be done. But I, I actually think that our officers that are there at the moment will, will be lucky if any of the five of them get back in. And I'm very sad about that because we have a man that runs our championship that's brilliant. Well, and I it's hope, an awful shame to, shame to see him go. I hope you get in anyway. Not, uh, I, sure. I hope you get in again, you know, you never know. Uh, What'll be will be, Joe. You know, exactly, it is no. what it is. And it's no good worrying about it because what will happen will happen. Um, JB Hansen, another Dan, Dan is he, uh, he won the Dubai, Darwin, do you see that? I didn't JB see that. Hansen, he won in Something Dubai, minus, minus 23. Harrington, Harrington uh, finished at minus 19. The thing I liked about Harrington, I saw a bit of the golf as well for my sins, he shot a 68 and three 67s. Not bad for an old one, as they say. Hmm. Yeah, he's, he's still good for an oldie. 
Cockcrack, uh, uh, Cockcrack, he won. I know he's an American. He won in Houston, but yeah. Owen Leone Maguire finished finished in in top thirteen at twenty five or something in the Pelican Open. She shot a sixty two or sixty eight, sixty eight, and of course her last round killed her seventy five. You know, but Nelly Carter, home Nelly Carter to me is a superstar. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. She's just a superstar. Yeah. Not enough exposure, in my opinion. And our sister Jessica as well. She must be. She finished in the top twelve or fifteen as well. You know, and their son, their brother, uh, he got into the final of the ATP tournament there. I think you. I know he win it or lose now during the week. I forgot to check it out. The superstar, super family. But golf, ladies, golf doesn't get enough exposure. We spoke about it here on the program before. Yeah. You know, yeah, anywhere near enough. Yeah if, you, yeah, if you look back on the Walker Cup, was it the Walker Cup? The ladies. Solent. The Southern Cup. Cup, yeah, the equivalent yeah. of the Ryder Cup, and you could watch that 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 over and over again. The quality oh. of the golf that was played, yeah. and the, and the, the competitive side of it. You know, there was nothing between the sides between Europe and America, and then you watch the Ryder Cup, and you know it was so one sided. Yeah. Um, and the men's game has become all about power. Um, yeah. You know the finesse. That, the, obviously, there is finesse, like there is, like we've seen it, but. Especially in America, power is everything, and we see the yeah. top guys are the guys that hit it the longest, and it's yeah. almost like it becomes a shootout. Well, in the ladies' game, it it's tending to be more the best player, as in the overall player, um, is tending to actually come out on top. Yeah, I, I've been in Miami all week. Uh, with Rick Smith, who's uh, probably top five golf coaches in mm. the US, certainly. Yeah, uh, he had four or five of his tour players there this week. Uh, they also had one of the long drive guys there, who he kind of says he coaches, but I think it's just a case of watching it more than anything else. But this guy was pitching it at four hundred yards. Jesus. Yeah, flying it. I, I stood next to it. I was actually with Rick Smith all week coaching a couple of his guys. Yeah, three uh, D stuff and. This guy was, well, I mean, he was flying it through the air at 400 yards. So you could, I couldn't see the ball after 200. Well, we, we were struggling to actually see where they were pitching at the end. It was yeah. only the fact that it's a 400-yard driving range and it's double-ended. There was hotel guests at one end and this performance centre is at the other end of the range. And he was actually bombing it into the guys going out to play from the hotel. <laughs> and that's the only reason we knew what it, what it was. It was actually, I mean, so I counted one at about 15 seconds before it landed. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to say about golf. As you said, it was all summed up for me in the Ryder Cup when we were, uh, there. the European Tour has relaunched as, as the DP Tourism, is it? DP World Tour, yeah, because the European Tour now is owned by the American Tour. It's owned by the oh, US PGA. So what they've been doing is that they're circumnavigating this concept of having a world tour. So what the America have now done is basically bought the European Tour. So they've now got the tournaments in Asia. They've got the tournaments in uh, Middle East, South Africa, Africa. So now this is now going to be rebranded as the world tour. And you, what you'll find now is Americans will get parachuted in for certain events to boost the prize funds and boost the sponsors. And you'll have five out of the top 20 dropping in parachuting in for events. So you will have less opportunity for European golfers to shine on their yeah. own. Tour. Yeah. But it could be very serious couldn't it, for the development of the game. Well, the trouble is with the game, especially at pro level, is the players vote for all of this mm. and turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So it's yeah, price I fund. think, Darwin, would I be right to say it's all about the money? Yeah, if price funds go up, the top 50 guys don't care about the last 50 guys. Um, <laughs> they're only interested in themselves. And, you know, you're going to find prize funds now. So if you think of the um, WGC events, which have always been more prize fund but on a different level like the top 100 in the world can play yeah. you know it's very selective you're you're going to get 
this world tour running on a very similar basis. They're going to, they're going to be pulling in for sponsors, bigger names, more gates, more TV money, everything else. But the price fund is going to go through the roof. Gentlemen, is that in response to the Greg Norman idea there when he was over with the Saudis at hand with the big pot of money? Yeah, well, Greg, Greg Norman's been banging that drum for, a, for like 30 years about being a world tour. Um, and all of that Saudi golf stuff, uh, we have a relationship with Saudi Golf Federation through the 3D golf system. Yeah. And they've been banging that drum and Norman's finally managed to knock a couple of barriers down. And the players will vote for it because the top 50 guys are just going to earn even more money. And what does this mean then for the guys that are on the Challenge Tour? The guys challenge, are trying to, yeah. Challenge Tour will basically become a little, they'll have a little bit of money thrown at them just to keep them quiet, really, to be honest. There'll be a little bit of money, th you know, throw them a bone and, and they'll go away. But like Pat just said, the opportunities now will start getting tighter. Because you're also, don't forget, you're going to have, I dare say that some of these events, you know, will have the top 75 on the US Order of Merit coming straight in. Jeepers. And of course, the ladies game needs more money put into it as well. I think myself, as you said, Martin, I totally agree with you. The Solheim Cup was a fantastic advertisement for golf, tournament golf, in comparison to the Ryder Cup. Let's be honest about it, lads. The Ryder Cup was over on Saturday. Yeah, yeah the Ryder Cup was a total letdown, wasn't it? I mean, it was an anti-climax of, of all anti-climaxes, really. Yeah. It's a pity, I mean, that Harrington was, pity that Harrington was the captain. You know, in one yeah, way. you got to feel sorry for Harrington because he's he's got 12 guys who probably eight of them are out of form. Um, you probably could argue if a couple of them didn't really want to be there anyway. No, they um, did not. And, you know... It's just wasn't wasn't ever going to be, and they were, you know. But I think the captain and his two vice captains should pick the the team. Joe, what do you think? The captain and the vice captain should pick the team. The mind is hard, the rubbish. Because McElroy was playing horrible golf, he shouldn't have been on the Ryder Cup. You know. Well, I think you got those four wild cards, haven't you? And I think what you you end up doing is you don't pick the guys who are actually running into form. You're actually always picking guys off experience. And I'm not sure that's exactly the right way of doing it. No, no. Well, the problem that you had with the, the Ryder Cup um, for the Europeans was they were working off two, two lists. They were working yeah. off the world rankings and then they were working off the European Order of Merit. The yeah. problem being on that was... Um, on the world rankings, it was very hard for anybody to displace the top four no matter what they did because they were so far ahead of everyone else. Yes. And the problem on the European tour listings was that because of the reduced prize money in a lot of the events, that when it came to the PGA and Wentworth, it was like seven or eight times what they had been playing for. So that event probably would have was worth maybe four or five events over the course of the season. Right, Chris. And, and the second problem that you had was that you had, depending on where people were, they fluctuated that there was like one situation where Fiesberger, even though Lowry did better than Fiesberger, he was able to displace him on the world tour and Lowry missed out on that, even though he performed better in the competition. So you had guys going... Jesus, no matter what I do today, I'm not going to get in there because this guy is going to displace me no matter what I do. And so you had, and I think the biggest problem that they had was they 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 left the picks. They only had four picks while the Americans had six picks because the yeah. Americans realized that it would have to be more on form than anything else. So they were able to pick more players who that the captain thought were playing well. But I think one of the major problems was that the finalization of the European team was two less than two weeks before the competition started, which meant that everything was in a rush. You were you were kind of rushing to get into the team. And then once it happened on Sunday night that you're in, you were either in and out. You were then rushing to get the suits, rushing to get the planes, rushing to get the, the hotels. And you only had that kind of high and then come back to reality within like you're right, Chris, six, because days, six days. 
invariably, if a person won the PGA at Winport, they could invariably go into the Ryder Cup. Well, it, 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 turned, it transpired what happened basically was that because of the way Wiesberger was able to get the world ranking points, he was able to knock Lowry off and Lowry had to be a pick when he really should have been able because of, if it was like a normal competition. The, the, problem yeah. stemmed, the problem stemmed from the fact that there was a reduced prize money in European Tour at a lot of the events this year. When you look at the, the schedule, some of the events were only getting two million prize money. And a lot of the fellas didn't bother play for that. They went to America or whatever, and they weren't informed. Derwin's point is 100% correct. There was probably seven to eight fellas who just wasn't up to the standard, and they were out of form. And you can't turn it on like a light switch. I think think one of the problems that you've got is, you know, the European Tour used to have, you had to play in 11 events to keep your membership. Yeah, but the 11 events includes the Masters, the US Open, no, no, the US no. PGA. It did, it? it did last year, two years ago. No, no. That, and they've changed that. It's only four events now. Ridiculous. Which, you Jeez. know, when you start including the majors, you know, McElroy doesn't have to play in Europe. He'll just play the majors. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you suddenly stand there and go, well, where's he going? He's going to go. You know, they play in, a, in what we call a B event on the main US tour. And they're still playing for four or five times the yeah. amount the European Tour yeah. is playing. Yeah, yeah. You see, yeah, the problem, it- the, 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 the problem basically is that of the four events that McElroy has to play in the European Tour, three of them are the Irish Open, Scottish Open, and the British Open. Yeah, I mean, but he doesn't, you know, he didn't even he didn't even play PGA championships this year. No, he did not, no, he didn't. But we were say, we're 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 lauding the Salheim Cup and anyway, lads on this on this little show here on the final whistle to watch in future because it's more competitive. I think watching the women, the Pelican over the weekend, I thought was super fantastic entertainment. Joe, I, I didn't follow up anything lads on the NFL this week. Here. I didn't have time to dip into what they're playing. I don't know. Was our friend playing Tom Brady? If anyone uh, no idea, I didn't put anything down. <laughs> oh, Dave. Yeah. Um, You're worse than Ryan. Tampa are on a bit of a slump at the moment. Yes. They lost again yesterday. Um, I forget who who beat them, um, but they seem to be kind of um, either injuries or what have you are affecting them. Uh, yeah. Green Bay beat uh, uh, Seattle Seahawks last night, seventeen uh, nil. It's the first time in ten years that Seattle have not scored a point in a game. Uh, Kansas City Chiefs won yesterday. And it seems to be now the two top teams that they're talking about um, are the Chiefs and the, and the Packers. Uh, okay. Although tonight, um, Arizona, the Cardinals play the Rams tonight yeah. uh, in the AFC West, um, which that should be a good game. Um, and, but, uh, yeah, it's... Um, uh, our our boy Tom Brady is uh, is having a bit of a struggle at the moment. Well, we'll we'll give him that. We'll give him that. We'll allow him that little slump in the middle. So are they much? Are they off it? So Tampa Bay would they be not? Will they? Will they? Won't they? Won't be in the running for to for the what's it called Super Bowl? Well, you know they could be. You know they could be because their division may not be that. Um, uh, oh. that competitive, yeah. So they they may. I haven't really looked at their um at their division recently to see who's doing well there or not. Um, but you know you had the Detroit Lions. Uh, they had the first draw of the season in the NFL yesterday. Detroit Lions, who haven't won for something like nineteen games or something like that, I believe. Uh, they tied yesterday with um, with um, Pittsburgh with the Steelers, uh, who had uh, uh, Roethlisberger out. He was injured. Their backup didn't have a very good day, so the, the game was tied. So they're uh, they've lost nine, uh, one none, and tied one is their record uh, for the Colts this year. So uh, it just depends on on the strength. Uh, uh, Tampa Bay may still have a losing record and win their own division. That's the way it works sometimes. Well, I presume England have done the trick, Darwin, have they? 
No, it's still 6 0. Yeah, that's a very tight match there. That's uh, <laughs> we're looking at the match there. It's, very, it's, San Mar- I think San Marino have gone man to man marking now. Very yeah. disappointing. <laughs> um, England haven't scored in the last 10 minutes. I know, it's been really bad. Well, can anyone tell me where is the next Rugby World Cup being held? I forgot to look it up. France. Oh, and I far to go. France, yeah, yeah. You can go and join Andy Farrell in his swan song. Yeah, we, we might get accreditation lads, for that, you know, to be nice, wouldn't it? Lovely. And, and, you, can do uh, the, you can do the interview and that's fine. You will leave that with you. <laughs> I'd never be able to. Chris, you just want to walk him into trouble. That's all you he want. Does, he do. doesn't need much encouragement. He can do that all by himself. Yeah, please. <laughs> Explain to me what's happened with with um, Irish rugby because I was really looking forward yesterday. I got in and I thought, right, Amazon on. I'm going to watch all the replays. Yeah. So I watched the England game, the Wales game in the afternoon. Right. Watched the England replay in the morning. Yeah. And then I went looking for the Irish Ireland New Zealand game. Channel 4 have it. Ah, but good man. Thanks, the, Chris. Uh, RTE have it and Channel 4 have it. However, next season, Amazon Prime will have the Irish internationals. Right. Ah. In the autumn. That's the deal, apparently. So that yeah. takes it away from us to watch then? At 100%. Unless we got Amazon. Because, if you, yeah. because, because my family connections here, we watch the Wales internationals. And on Amazon Prime... You can watch the Welsh internationals in English and in or in Welsh, whatever you want to do. So but, that's go, that will, will that's going to have to happen. That if that, that the deal, I believe the deal has been struck that next autumn internationals next year, twenty twenty two, will be on Amazon and RTE will not have it. That's disgraceful. Is the Six Nations on Amazon now? No. Nope. Thank so God. The Six Nations is as it was, where BBC and ITV carve it up. Right, and then RT will have the Ireland will have no, not RT. Sorry, TV three will have the will have all the other matches. The Virgin Virgin Media, whatever they call it now. So Virgin that's Media, what they will have. They won. Yeah. They won the right to the, the, the pay more. They pay BBC more. and ITV share it. Right, they've done that for the last couple of years to try and keep it out of try and keep it away from a paywall. How long that will go? You don't know. Not sure well, because the I mean, the, the thing about okay. it, the, the thing is, is that there was a stake of the Six Nations Championship sold to a venture capitalist group. I'm not sure whether it was for like 50 or 100 million. I'm not sure on the figures, but each of the six teams get a, a wedge of money. So you can near enough expect them looking for their money back. And while where they're going to get the money back, Amazon Prime and something. Yeah, and also the, the cost of going to the matches, uh, Martin, and that, all of us there in, in Lanzarote is shocking now, Martin. Yeah, like tickets don't come cheap anymore for for rugby. Um, I, I've heard like 130 euro for the weekend. 75, 75 Seven, is the cheapest for next yeah. weekend against Argentina. Yeah, so I think I think wow. the top price was 130 yeah. uh, against. against to, I mean, if you were to go yourself and and if you had a if you could find some friend to go with, you, 150 quid to see Ireland and Argentina. Are you are you kidding me? No? Matt, if you wanted to bring a child and you're trying to encourage children and they love rugby, you couldn't afford to bring them. No. What you do, Pat, is bring a child, get him to run on the field, take the fella's jersey off the best player and sell it on eBay to me a couple of weeks later. That's what Good you do. Good I actually, I get actually, your money back. I actually think that little girl getting that jersey was well planned in advance. I'd oh, of course. Well and I, I was going to say it at the time and I will say it now. I have a you probably say to me, oh, God, he's at it again. But I have a bit of a problem with the fact that it happened because what you're going to do is you're going to encourage that kind of right. behavior again. And the problem I have is, is when you look at what happened at the Wales-South Africa match a couple of weeks ago where a fella came on, you know, it's all, okay, it's a kid, it's a girl, fine, I get it. But the problem is, is that, in like Joe would tell you, and I know in Australia – they have a zero tolerance on people entering the field of play because you just don't know what these guys carry. Yeah. And, and Joe... And that happens, look, it happens. Before we... Are, we have our own Joe here. We have our own uh, superstar here. Joe can always sign George, he says, if you want anything, you know? <laughs> well, I, ha- I had one signed by Joe years ago. 
Fantastic. <laughs> How much is that brought down? And, uh, oh, just priceless. Sorry, it's priceless. And it's up in the, sorry, Joe, but it's up in the attic somewhere. I didn't give it away. Yeah. <laughs> Anna. Right where it should be, Anna. Right Anna, where it should be. <laughs> so, it should be in a glass case. So from Chris, from Darwin, Anna, Martin and Joel, it's been a blast. Thank you very much for uh, for on for this edition of the final whistle here on Near Media, and we hope to have some good news, exciting news in a couple of weeks' time. But from this edition, from we all get paid. Of us... <laughs> <laughs> that, if, if if we're not going to get paid, it's not I that can't good see, news. No, I can't see how <laughs> exciting. So. I cannot see how exciting is going to be, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> good, good I evening. mean, you flew, hang on a second now. Before you go, you flew Derwin over yeah. on first business class, and yeah. you still couldn't get his clubs over. You have yeah. exciting news. Are you going to tell us you're going to pay? I know what it is. You're going to take us out on a Christmas party, and you're going to buy us drink that night. Okay. Okay. Poor Joe. Joe, he's flying Joe over. He's flying Joe over from Seattle, all Seattle. the way from Seattle. Oh, I'd be happy to come. Joe, we, we'll all meet. We'll all meet Joe at the spot of dog. Okay. Yeah, no, do you know what yeah, we could do, Pat? Pat, we could actually run a bus to Seattle. I don't know why. Yes. Yeah. We could run a bus to Seattle, Joe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> 20 we'll quid see, return. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll see you again soon. Take care, lads. Bye. Good, Good night. Night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good see you. Good night.